Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Cliff Briscoe. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. All right, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to continue where I was last week, and we're going to go uh, further today. As I said last week, um, in in my prayer time, just spending time with the Lord, I wasn't trying to get a word from God. I wasn't saying, God, give me a word for 2018, which probably would have been a good thing to do, but I wasn't doing that. I wasn't trying to get a word from the Lord, and the Lord just dropped into my spirit. And I was just thinking about, you know, 2018 and just kind of pondering, you know, what it might look like, but I wasn't asking for a word. And the Lord just said to me, what about me? And then he just dropped it in my heart, more of him in 2018. And that's our word for this year. And we've, our elders and pastors, we've talked about it. And we feel like that's a word for our our body. And I think for more than us, but for us, it is more of him. And when the Lord said that to me, it was, it felt melancholy. It was like, what about me? As if to say, am I not enough? You know, when you talk about 2018, a lot of times we talk about breakthrough or, you know, uh, we're going to see, you know, more prosperity or we're going to see healing and and we want to see all of that. But yet, is that really what we're after? I mean, would it not be a great thing if our quest next year wouldn't just be breakthrough, but would be more of him, not just abundance but more of him because I believe that when you have more of him you get breakthrough you get abundance you get prosperity you get healing and in a lot of times the body of Christ we just forget that this is not difficult you know serving God I mean it's profound it's profound but it's not difficult God's made it easy there's one way he didn't choose five Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father except by me so there's not five ways and some people want to argue about that and say that's not good but that's to your advantage it's to your advantage there's not five ways what if you choose the sixth way if God says there's one way then you just obey that you go after that and you don't have to wonder later on like I wonder if I wonder if this is right Jesus said this is it it's narrow, it's really narrow, and I don't know about you, I've had people call me narrow before and they thought they were slamming me and I took it as a compliment. <laughs> but um, anyway, in talking about more of him, more of him, what, how do you do that? What, what does more of him look like? I mean, that's a really grandiose kind of word very all-encompassing but what does that mean what does that look like and the Lord just directed me to the Beatitudes what we commonly call the Beatitudes um, in Matthew chapter 5 and starting at verse 1 and seeing the multitudes he went up on a mountain and when he was seated his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now last week we talked about the first three or four of these and I'm going to just quickly hit them. I'm not going to spend much time on them. You can go online and watch the the video. But blessed are the poor in spirit. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What, what does that mean? It basically means that you've come to the end of yourself. You realize that you are bankrupt. It's not talking about money. It's talking about spiritually. It's not poor in money. It's poor in spirit. The person that this is referring to is a person that's come to recognize, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. I, have in, I am unable to do this without God. I am poor in spirit. And so he says, when you become that way, you shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. You, you don't get to first base with God until you realize you don't have it, but he does. It isn't, you know, God didn't say, hey, become a Christian, become a Christian, and then, then we show God how good we're going to be. Anybody ever try that? Uh, you know, I, I tried that as a kid. I didn't know how to be a Christian, so I just thought, you know, I'll really try hard. And I failed really, really miserably. You know, I didn't last any time because it wasn't in me. And I hadn't come to the end of myself. When you come to the end of yourself, like I did, or some, you know, some, somewhere along the line, you come to a situation similar to my situation when I was 20 years old and I realized I'm just dying on the inside. And God came into my room where I was and just, and I wasn't saved, but he started talking to me, telling me to read the word of God. And right there alone, for like over three hours, the glory of God came into the room by myself and I was changed just like that. I'm still talking about it and it's been 44 years ago. But I talk about it like it was yesterday because that's how powerful it was. I exchanged my life for his. I became poor, but in the process, I entered the kingdom of heaven. And that's what happens. When you become poor, you realize you don't have it. You begin to make an entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, now, and we're talking about more of him. You can't get more of him unless you get less of you. If, if you're on the top rung, you're the, you're the guy, you're the girl, you're it. And it's always about you. Life is about you. Blah, blah, blah. You'll never get to first base. Really in what we're talking about in 2018, we, there's a, a, a neediness. And, and I know in, in like a faith man that, I, that we all are, we're not supposed to say stuff like that. But yet, even though we are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, we are not anything without him. Our righteousness comes from him totally and completely. His presence, his word, his spirit, his rebirth on the inside of us. So we become poor. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You have to come to the place that you don't want the other kingdom. You have to come to the place that you actually mourn over it, that you realize, I don't want the other spirit. I don't want those thoughts. I don't want them crowding in. And it isn't just that you ask for forgiveness. It's that you turn from it. And there is a sorrow about ever embracing it and a weeping over it, a, a concern, absolute down into the depth of your soul that you would ever have trodden that dark path and you turn from it with great, great mourning and great remorse. The Bible calls that repentance, not very exciting in today's circles. No one really wants to do that because I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay, but we're not okay. We're not, if we're embracing darkness, we're not okay. And we need to have an aversion to it, get away from it, run from it, make a decision. And then he says, if you'll do it, you'll be comforted. And so the person that does that, it's the same word that Jesus used when he said, I'm going to send you another comforter. Remember that? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's going to send you another comforter. And so I think what he's saying here is that when you turn from the other kingdom, when, from, when you turn from darkness and you embrace light, the Spirit of God comes. You get more of him. When you leave that, go, go in the other direction. He picks you up right there. And so you are comforted. You receive more of the Holy Spirit. Then he says also, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. The meek are those that have decided I am under the authority of someone else. A meek person isn't bucking up saying, you don't tell me what to do. Man, that was my problem. When I was 20 years old, I had, my mantra was, my mantra was nobody's going to tell me what to do. I mean, what a fool. I mean, you just want to see a fool. Just get a, my face and you can make a poster child out of me at the age of 20. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And I go around saying, I don't care what anybody thinks. But the fact of the matter, it was that I did. You know, I had faded jeans and a work shirt buttoned down to here. And I didn't care what anybody thought. But I wouldn't have been caught dead wearing anything else. Because 
that was that was me, man. I had blue shoes. They were actually kind of. I know that sounds terrible, but they were blue shoes with white soles. They were really pretty cool. But anyway, but you know, just ignorant fool that 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 we are. We think we're it. And when you come, once you become poor and you become the person that is not wanting that kingdom, you come under the authority of someone else. And the Bible calls it meekness, that you've made that decision that you are a meek person. You don't get to tell God or anyone else really what to do. And you do it all the time. You go into McDonald's and you either order the way they want. You have to be meek enough to go in and say, I'll have one of those, one of those, one of those. And then you have to be meek enough to give them the money or you're not getting anything. Right? Everybody does it. Everybody comes under the authority. When you go to work, you don't tell your boss what you're going to do. He tells you what you're going to do, or you get fired. So it's just up to you. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. We're, we all uh, have meekness in some way, somewhere that we are under the authority. But we are talking about under the authority of God all the time, that we are living like that. And I know you say, well, I mess up. Well, join the club. We all mess up. But our, our general idea is Jesus is Lord, right? And then we talked about that we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And, and when Jesus talks about it, I like to think of it like, what were they thinking when Jesus said hunger and thirst? And he's not talking about, oh man, I'd like an Arby's, you know, I'm really hungry for an Arby's sandwich and those, those, those um, seasoned ring, potato rings that they have. I'm really hungry for that. That's not the kind of hunger we're talking about. I'm really hungry for a milkshake, man. That's not, that's not hunger. You, no one in America, probably in this room, have, has ever experienced hunger and thirst the way these people do because their lives depended on daily bread. When Jesus said, I want you to pray like this, give us this day our daily bread, they depended on daily bread. They had to have it today or it's not gonna happen today. They had to have that. They didn't get paid weekly or monthly, they got paid daily. And, and they, even the, the Bible would talk about evil uh, uh, people lording it over their workers that wouldn't pay them their hire for the day. They needed that today. They probably had to go home to the market before they went home to buy enough food just for that day. So we're talking about hunger and thirst. They didn't have a tap water where they could just go over and get them, get them some water. They lived life hoping that there's going to be enough today. So this is the kind of hunger that you have to have with what Jesus is talking about. And he says, you will be filled. This, all of these things, and I'm hoping that <laughs> as we study all eight of them in two weeks, you probably should take one at a time, but I'm just going to cram them all in in two weeks, that I'm just hoping that you'll grab even one or two of them to open the way for more of God in your life, more of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you get all eight of them, let me know about it because I know that you must be the second coming of Jesus or something. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, when we talk about this, and again, this, all of these things open the way up for more of God, more of him. What does he mean, blessed are the merciful? Basically, someone who's merciful is someone who gets inside the skin of somebody else. And I, this is a hard one, I'm, I admit for me, because I, a lot of times, want to just say, just do the word, you know, just here's the word of God. Just do the word. What, I mean, what's your struggle here? What's the matter with you? Just, just here's what the Bible says and slap them up the head with the Bible. And yet, you know, sometimes you can't do that with people. You say, well, why not? Why can't they just be meek enough to take the word? Some people are pretty broken and they hurt and they've, they've been down a road that they need a little bit of mercy and a little bit of compassion. You need to get inside their skin to know what's going on. I'll give you several examples. I had a lady in her church, and this was 30 something years ago, and she was just always struggling. And I, you know, and, and sometimes there's people you minister to, and you minister to, and you minister to, and you minister to, and they just don't seem to get it, and you just want to go, you know, the spirit of slap comes on you. What, what is the matter with you? Why can't you get this? And finally, one day we sat down and talked together and she, she just, I mean, just gushed out of her. She said, from the time I was six years old until I was 17, I got married and left home. 
My dad had sex with me three times a week my whole life. I'm not, I'm not talking stepdad. I'm talking about father, biological daddy. And she said, my mother found out about it. We went to counseling for like two weeks and we quit and it never stopped. She said, I had sex with my dad three times a week at least. She said, sometimes every day, every, because my mom wouldn't be home. She's working, he's at home and he'd get me in the bedroom and she said, that's the way I lived. That was growing up. And when I heard that, it changed everything about how I dealt with this woman. And I tried to think about, you know, my life. I had a pretty good life. I kind of was leave it to Beaver. I, you know, my brother was not Wally, that's for sure. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I can't even imagine. I can't. And so I try to put myself in her place that that is how she grew up, that her father was her sexual partner for 11 years from the time she could remember until she left home. She was having sex until two weeks before she left home to be married. Now, this person... Uh, you can kind of imagine she dressed in long dresses, wouldn't shave her legs and um, no makeup. I mean, she was just trying to hide because she felt so horrible about herself. And we as, as believers have to sometimes back up and realize there's people have had some things happen that are just absolutely abnormal, abnormal and you can't always just throw the Bible at them and say, do this. You're gonna have to pull them in talk to them, tr you know, treat them in a different way. Jesus did that. Remember the lady caught in adultery? You know, what's the law say? She's got to be stoned. She is just a filthy adulterer. And of course they caught her in the act. And of course <laughs> you probably heard those stories. These guys caught her in the act. How do you catch someone in the act of adultery? How, how do you do that? I mean, unless you're in the closet waiting for them. It, it sounds to me like this was a trap. But anyway, they caught her in the act of adultery and brought her and didn't bring the man, by the way, but brought her. So that also tells me something. But they bring her and it was a test of Jesus. And Jesus, in dealing with it, begins to write on the ground. We don't know what he wrote. This is what I think. I think he starts writing on the ground the sin of everybody in the circle. Starts writing something about them. And they start dropping off one by one by one by, until there's nobody left. And I think what Jesus was doing was, okay, yeah, she's guilty. She, has commi she is a fornica fornicator. She is an adulterer. You caught her in the act. But I want to ask you, what, before we throw the stone, let me ask you something. Woo they start backing out, right? Getting in someone else's skin. You know, I, I can talk about gloves. I can tell you, you know, leather gloves with lining in them are really great. You ought to try, you, you ever had one? No, I never had one. I don't think they're that good. Well, just wait though, as soon as you put one on. <laughs> now, now it's all, it's different, isn't it? Now I've, I've, I've put my hand in one. I can feel that. And the same is true with people. There's people that you've got to take the time to get inside where they've been before you start ministering certain things to them. And so the Bible says, blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. Now, I mean, what does that mean? If you, if you are a person that... Um, can treat people like this, what begins to happen is you, you begin a relationship with them. Now, this, this is why this is hard because it's going to take some time. It's going to take effort to get inside someone else's skin. But when you do that, you begin a relationship with that person and they begin maybe to confide in you and you are then becoming a person that can receive that kind of mercy too. You establish relationships where other, when, when you mess up, other people will want to do what you've done for others, that they want to get inside your situation too and not just, and don't we like to do that in the body of Christ though? We like to throw things at people um, sometimes. I mean, maybe that's not you, but we don't understand 
what it's like to be them. When my mother, um, when I was a kid, I was, I don't know, it was the late 50s, early 60s, and I remember she had a book called Black Like Me. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that book, but it, it was the story of a guy, he was a white man, and some, I don't know how he did this in the 50s, but in, 19, in the 1950s, he somehow changed the pigment of his skin to become black. And I, and I don't know, you, what do you do? Can you just shoot pigment in there and make it do that? But he looked like a black man. And so he lived like a black man. I think it was for two or three years. He wanted to know what it was like as a white man to be black. And the story of the book is horrific. It's just horrific. And of course, it changed my mother's life. And me just hearing her talk about it, it made me go, wow, I never thought about that. That black people were treated like that just on a regular daily basis wherever they went. One pastor, when he, he decided to, that God was calling him to this very affluent church to become the pastor there. And they were kind of regarded as a snooty, look down your nose kind of people. And so he decided to take the church. And the day that he was going to be brought before the congregation and uh, as a pastor, he dressed up as a hobo. He, he didn't shave. He smelled. He stunk. He put on dirty, filthy clothes. And he came to church like that. And you can imagine he's, they, they didn't treat him very well. It's like, what are you doing here? This is not the kind of place we are. And they set him in the back of the church and really just kind of scorned him. And then then when they got ready to introduce the pastor, they couldn't find him. And they were looking around and the elders were saying, pastor, and then, he, then this guy looks like a hobo comes walking to the front and, and the elders are, and ushers are trying to stop him. And they, he finally takes off enough of his garb, they realize it's him. And he got inside the skin of someone else to be able to talk to the congregation and say, look, this is how you treat people. This is what you do. Is this, is this the kind of church that we want to be if we're calling ourselves Christians? And I've really wanted to do that here. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've thought, I, if, if I could disappear for a couple of weeks and just grow a beard and, and then and not take a bath and you know, just scuzzy myself, I just wonder what you all would do with that. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's being merciful right? You get inside the skin of somebody else. Now, in doing that, though, you have to be careful that you don't become wishy-washy, ishy-gishy, that you get inside their skin and say, it's okay. It's okay. You can be an adulterer. I understand the struggle. Oh, I, you, you struggle with same-sex attraction? You know, I, I, that's okay. I, I understand. What, what being merciful does is it doesn't change the standard. We don't change the standard and now say, you know, homosexuality is okay and adultery is okay. And if you want to steal from people, I know you have an addiction. You just wanted that, didn't you? I understand that. I'd like to have that too. So I, you just stole it. And oh, that's okay. But, no, but what it does do, when, when we get inside the skin of someone else, it helps us to address them with mercy and not with just some kind of a, you know, you better just do this because the Bible says so. It causes us to draw them to us to speak the same word, but maybe in a different way. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? And then we make a friend and we, we, we have someone that knows that we love them, that we care about them, but we don't change the standard. We never change the standard. And that's, that's part of what happens in the body of Christ. In the name of mercy, everything becomes okay. It's never okay. It's never going to be okay. The only reason that God wants us to be merciful is so that we can reach people with kindness, with caring, but hold the standard just as high and love them right into the standards of God and, and into the Holy Spirit. You all still out there? Then Jesus says, blessed are the, and that, to me, that's going to take more of him, won't it? It'll take more of him. That if we become merciful people, it will take more of him, more of his presence, more of his power, more of his glory, more of him to be able to do the things that God is calling us to do. Then he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And as I meditated on that and thought, you know, what, 
what do you mean by pure in heart? And, and what, the Lord, what rose up inside of me is that someone who's pure in heart doesn't have an agenda. They don't have an ulterior agenda. They genuinely care about you and they're not a manipulator. They're not trying to manipulate you into something that they want. They are genuinely, transparently coming to you, loving you without trying to twist you and manipulate you into something else. There is not another agenda. The agenda is, I love you, I want to help you. Really, those, those people are not, they're kind of few and far between. <laughs> Because most people have an agenda. Most people have their own thought about how they want things to be and how they want things to do, and they'll work you for it. And, you know, as a pastor, over 40 years, I've had people work me. I remember one guy, this was down at Maine and Beard, so we were talking you know, a long, long time ago, so don't try and figure it out. But he, he would come up to me after I'd preach, and I mean, he would tell me that I was the greatest thing that ever was. There's nobody could, I mean, I mean, basically just saying, you're the best preacher I've ever heard. And how many of you, how many agree with the guy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, how could he help himself? But anyway, he, <laughs> no, I'm, wipe that clean. He just w went on and on and on about how great I was. And, you know, I knew I'm not a bad preacher. I don't think I'm the best that ever was. But I'm listening to him going, you know, there's something not, something going on here. He's pulling for something. And there's a difference in flattery and someone encouraging you in, in being, you know, gifted or something. And because when people flatter you, they're looking to take something from you. They're not really there for you. They are looking to pull something out of you. And it didn't take me very long to figure out he, he wants something. And, uh, and, you know, finally, it's a long story, but the, one of the last conversations I had with him, he was going to beat my face in. So that, that ought to, I mean, I'm serious. I, I had an elder come in the office with me because I thought, he, you know, when I confront him with the things that he's doing, he's going to get really mad. And then, uh, this guy, I mean, I don't consider myself to be a pansy. I think I can pretty much take care of myself. This guy would have mauled me. I mean, he was big and strong and tough and, and liked to hurt people. And... Um, and he basically told me, I'm going to beat your face in. And <laughs> he didn't do it because the guy I had with me was bigger than me. And so I figured, you know, we're probably in good shape. But anyway, um, and I, obviously he wanted something. He, he was looking to take something and he didn't get it. And when he didn't get it, but you see, that's not pure in heart. Someone who's pure in heart really if they don't get what they want, they kind of just move on and say, well, okay, I, I just was here to serve and that doesn't work out, then, then I can move on. I'm not, not mad. And most of the time they won't even be mad about it or even upset. They're not got holding a grudge because it, it wasn't about me. I'm just going to serve you if it doesn't work. Well, okay, if that's not what you want, but I'm still here. I, I, I'll offer and... Um, I, I try to think about people who are like that. I thought about in the Bible. Remember the lady that was in the Bible and she was in the temple. She just prayed all the time, prayed all the time, just seeking God. And she was in, what, 80 years old? Wasn't that how old she was? 84. She'd been a, been a widow for a long, long time and she just stayed there and prayed. For what reason would she be there for that other than I just want to see the glory of God. There's, God's up to something. I think she probably felt God was up to something. There's, there's a change coming. Perhaps it really is the time of the Messiah. And so she's praying and she's interceding and she's at the altar night and day, night and day praying. Of course, you know the story. Then Jesus shows up and she recognizes who it is. You know, people who pray will usually recognize what's going on when it happens in the spirit. And so this woman gets it. And so pure in heart. I mean, just, I don't have an agenda here. I just truly want to help you and I'm not going to manipulate you into something. And I don't know how this will sound to you, but honestly, April is one of the most pure hearted people that I know. She's not a manipulator. She genuinely does not try to get you to do something. 
she, and I told her that the other day when we were in bed and I said, you know, you're, you probably the purest person that I know because you are not, you really genuinely want to help people and are not trying to work them into something. And she kind of went, and she was stunned like, what? Are you serious? And usually people that are pure hearted don't even really totally realize that they are. Why? Because they're pure hearted. Are you still out there? And there's some pretty pure people in here, but you know, if I start choosing certain ones, if I choose her, I won't get in trouble, right? As a matter of fact, you kind of, you go home and go, oh, <laughs> pastor, this loves her so much. And I do. She's just, I love her a lot. But then he's, the Bible says that the pure in heart will see God. Well, what does that mean? The pure in heart will see, I, this is what I think. I think God looks for people like that. It isn't so much that you see him, others don't. It's, it's that God wants to get up beside people like that. That when he finds someone that's clean like that and pure like that, they don't have, and I, when, I say, I, when I say that, I didn't say perfect. I'm just saying they have motivations that are clean. And there are people that look like that they're really godly, but they don't have clear, clean motivations. Their motivations... You can, you can just feel it. If, if you're sensitive to the spirit, you can feel it that they're manipulating the atmosphere and they're manipulating people and they have an agenda and you better do it. And it's not pure. We're not after anything but God and wanting him. And when God sees that in a person, it's like, um, was it Nathaniel? When Nathaniel was coming, Jesus said to him, here's a guy with no guile. You don't really hear that much more about Nathaniel, but he said, here's a guy who has no guile. And I think what he was saying was, this guy is pure heart. He is not a person that is trying to get something. He is a person that is genuine. Are you still here? This will cause us to get more of God when we are purely motivated. Then Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Everybody say peacemakers. Blessed are the peace. What is a peacemaker? Well, the word peace comes from the Greek word iro, and it means to join together. It is to take something over here and something over here and to join them together. They now are made one together. And so peacemakers are people that create avenues. They create passageways for other people to get there. For instance, there's this, an exit out this door right here and if you go straight out this way there's an outside door and it goes it's an outside door that goes outside and so but this door gives an entrance into a little small hallway passageway to the left is our prayer room to the right is our stairs going up into the baptistry but this hall is a passageway to get somewhere else. And that's what people of peace do. They create, they create a passageway for other people to go through. They are people that want other people to experience God. And so they become people that create a way for other people to find a way into the presence of the Lord, and the, and the Bible calls them peacemakers. Now, they could be people that bring other people together, too. Like, I believe Josh and Bailey are destined with the, the, uh, the burn to bring people together. And to me, Josh and Bailey are actually two other people I think have really pure hearts. I think they'll be perfect to do it because I don't think they have an agenda. I don't think they have an agenda other than seeing the body of Christ come together. That I hear that in them all the time, that they talk about that, to see the body come together, to see other people from other churches coming and worshiping together. And they're perfect for it because they don't have an agenda. We're, we're not trying to build something on our own. We're not trying to jack up our whoever we are, just what we'd like to see us fellowship together. And so he says, blessed are the peacemakers. They, they become people, they're, they're conduits. Um, could I get, Patrick, could you plug that in over there? I've got this 
I've got this drill here, and if I need to use it over here, I need to use this drill over here, and there's not a plug, I can't get any power over here. So what, what happens? If I can get this to the power, if I can get this to the power that's over there, then this drill is going to be something I can use over here. I need a necklace. Yeah, thank you. And so if I can get what's over there, over here, then I can work this. You know, I probably shouldn't have done this because I tried this twice at home and it didn't work two times and then it worked three times and now it's not working. Anyway, but you get my point, right? It's not, not, quite, not, quite, as, not quite as forceful when it doesn't work, but anyway, oh, there it goes. I didn't have, I didn't have it pushed in all the way. So it, it sounds like it's on its last, last leg. It's not really what, one that I use anymore. But anyway, you get the, the point is that I needed this over here and this becomes a conduit to make this work. It's a peacemaker. It, it brings, thank you, it brings something together that without it, it won't happen. And can you see how important those kinds of people are in the body of Christ? People that bring people together, bring really, I mean, that's really what preachers should be. Preachers should be people that are bringing people together and causing, um, causing gatherings. Peacemakers create gatherings of people. Making peace, I have to qualify this, making peace does not mean that you agree with everybody for the sake of peace. It, it isn't that there are these people that are against the word of God and they don't want to walk with God, but you're going to go ahead and, and attach with them just because, well, it's in the, in the name of, of just being together is so important. And I don't agree with that. I don't think that's peace. First of all, peace is something that's joined to God. And if it's not God, you don't join to that. It isn't, it isn't peace because people decided not to fight anymore. It's not peace. I mean, I'll give you, for instance, I, I, God told me to go to the ministerial alliance. I went to it for several years and the main reason I didn't go to it before is I felt like they just compromised so much it's just hard for me to to be in that and I but I did and I went and then when the big homosexual agenda started coming up I finally just went to them and said look I need to know where we stand on this and there was only about six of us there well four of them believed that homosexual marriage was okay that they were marrying men and men women and women they had homosexual youth pastors best one they ever had according to them and I, I just I just had to back out as some people would say well shouldn't you just stay in there and be a light well I, I could but I don't I don't want to be a part of something that is advocating something that is directly a, the Bible calls it an abomination in the ears and eyes of God. And I think of it as, I don't think that I'm creating peace. I think I'm compromising. This is what I think. I don't think it's peaceful for me just to, you know, lay down. And you say, well, why do you make such a big deal out of it? Because it's just so basic. It's so basic. It, I'm not against homosexuals. I know a lot, I had friends in college that were homosexuals and I was not one. I have never participated in that particular sin. I've done just about everything else, but I've never participated in that. And I, they, some of them were very nice people, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't make it right. And for the church of all places, that ought to hold a standard up where people can find peace, that they, they, they can find a place that has a standard that's real and alive and not going to change because in the name of peace, we're all going to get together and lay down what's right. We, I don't think that that's peace and I don't think that that's God. But we do want to have compassion and mercy and help people to make the transition out. 
Are you still there? So we, to be, become a peacemaker, it's going to take some effort on our part, and it's going to take more of God. We want more of God. Now, one of the things I want you to know, though, is that if you're going to do that, if you're going to be one of those people, <clears throat> it's going to cost you something. People who make peace, real peace, they do things that, like this, you got water. And you can pour this packet in this bottle and they were separate but you put them together and mix it up and this becomes something else this becomes something else the, the two mix together and they have been joined together the Bible calls that Iro they, they become a, a total mixture but I want you to know if you begin to walk like this you become a conduit for God you become a person who is that cord to the power, there are going to be people that are going to take you and they are going to mind you. Because you think about this, with all the things that I've talked about, if we become peacemakers, we're actually joining people to God. If we become people that are merciful, we're getting inside the skin of someone else. We're understanding them and bringing them into the kingdom of God. That is so powerful, so powerful. It's going to take God, more of God in our life to do that. When we become people like that, I don't understand it, but the world is going to fight you over that. They're going to hate, you know what they do? They do things like this. Packets are bad. They're very, very, I mean, I'm looking, at this packet, all it is is a container to take this and get it in water. It's all, it's the only reason it exists. I hadn't done anything. I'm just doing my job. I'm, I'm full of all these, this, this is crystal light raspberry lemonade. And it's, it's just carrying this. There's nothing evil about it. It's just carrying this, hoping you'll put it in water and it will have done its job. But the world will begin to say, these are evil. But you know what? These are, these are packets and they're shiny and they, They've got, they've got evil stuff on the inside and they will take these little packets and they will rip them apart and let you know that, that gotta get, you got to get it on the line here. <laughs> let you know that this is wrong and they will tear these things, tear this apart. Might even start talking about, you know, water in plastic cause you cancer, which I don't know, they, it may be true, but you know what I'm saying though, they, they, start, they start destroying the messenger. These cords, look at these cords. Look at this, it's orange. It's gotta be wrong, any cord that's orange, evil. It's got to be evil. Don't use orange cords. They start throwing things at you. But here, you've got to realize, if, if you're going to do this, you just expect it. It just comes with it. Especially if you're pure-hearted and you're just doing it. You know, I'm not saying Living Word Church is perfect, but I'm going to tell you this. We've never had an agenda. Other than, I say that, we, we do have an agenda, but the only agenda we have are things like, we want to get people healed and filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in the Holy Ghost and saved. We want to take kids out of the schools and have the rock and, and disciple them into the things of God so that when they grow up, these young girls and boys taken from the middle school will grow up into good, strong men and women of God. The, when we come here, really all we want to do is we want to worship God. We want, to, we want to make an exchange with him, go after him with all of our heart, all of our strength. All, and it's always been that way. We don't have an agenda really other than we want you to grow up and be strong in Jesus. In your families, be good husbands, faithful wives, have good strong kids growing up that will serve God. There's not an agenda other than that. And if... <laughs> It's, you know, it's amazing to me that, that people can find things that they want to 
um, criticize you over. Someone was telling me, you need to go on the internet and read on there about all those preachers that are of the devil. And so I went on there and it was every big name preacher that you can think of. And I thought, well, you know, they didn't do one on me because I'm not big enough. But yeah, I probably believe, you know, what many of them believe, our church believes that. But all it really was, it was a, it was a target on the guys and women that were doing the most to bring peace into this world, to, to connect people with God. And all of a sudden they become a target. <laughs> Probably the worst target I ever had. I was in my twenties. I was like 25 and we just started living word church, you know, that year I was 25 years old and we were down on Maine and Beard on, and, and there was a preacher's wife that started telling people in the community that I was, um, having sex with the women that were in their 60s and 70s and taking their social security checks away from them. I'm, I'm 25? I'm 25. I mean, I would at least think that if, if I was going to do something that evil, I would at least, you know, hit someone in their 40s at least, but, you know, I mean, I'm 60s looking, 60s are looking pretty good now, but you know, I'm just 25 years old and they, they, they're going after me like with both barrels that I was this evil person. And I just want you to know, I've never seen a social security check <laughs> until the last couple of years. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have known what one looked like. Are you all still out there? So, um, God is calling us for more of him. And it isn't just, God, just, you know, the, you know give me more of him and let me shake and fall on the ground. It, it's, it's okay. We, we're glad for any encounter. We're, we want any encounter. But God is gonna, wants to do a work in us that we become people of stature, of peacemakers, of purity, of, of um, holiness that we become poor in spirit, that he can fill us, that we become people that are hungry and thirsty for him. That's our goal in 2018. And I'm praying for you that that be your goal. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Cliff Briscoe. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.